Each fall, Fort Lauderdale becomes the worldwide epicenter of the yachting industry and home of the largest boat show in the world. But maybe more importantly, for a brief moment, Fort Lauderdale's long-standing reputation as the yachting capital of the world is once again confirmed. When the show leaves here, the industry stays here, continues to grow here, continues to be the largest employer here, and the second largest industry in Florida. But why here? It's the people. People who decided to make their careers here long ago and then decided to stay. Their futures could be traced to a single twist of fate. It's a story of incredible and almost impossible timing and of one couple's success against any number of odds. This is the story of a young couple who on their honeymoon decided to buy a boat yard. Neither one of them had any practical experience in the boat business, had ever built a boat, or knew much about the reality of owning a boat yard. But five years later, in this small boat facility on the South Fork of the New River in Fort Lauderdale, they not only became the largest employer in Broward County, but the largest defense contractor in Florida. They would later become the first American yacht builder to have the largest order book in the world. How is this possible? Dooley's yard was on the Navy's bid list as he had built a series of patrol boats during World War II. After two horrible back-to-back -back hurricanes, he sold the yard. I've always wondered if the reason that they decided to have a honeymoon in Fort Lauderdale was because they got some amazing deal, right? I mean, who the hell would want to go down to Fort Lauderdale right after two back-to-back -back hurricanes? Um, and I always found that just a really, really neat bit of our family's history was that it started as a honeymoon, this sort of like connecting point between two people. And, and there's no doubt that that decision changed not only our lives and our kids' lives, uh, but also uh, the people of Fort Lauderdale and the people of Broward County. Shortly after the young couple bought the yard, which was mainly doing repairs at the time, a bid went out for the construction of 12 wood minesweepers. If there was one thing that Frank Dennison could have been ultimately known for was the fact that he was described as a production genius. And this came out very clearly with those minesweeper orders when they said there's no way that he could do it. Number one, the boats were too deep in draft, the river would never take it. What he did was he decided to build half of the boat in the main yard and the other half in Port Everglades. So he built the boats light, launched them sideways in a very narrow canal which obviously had never been done before in the New River, and then decided to float them down with very high, high uh, water lines when it reached Port Everglades. The top was, uh, and engines, and armament, and the superstructure was married to it, and that became the absolute blueprint for his success in getting those deliveries out. I don't think anybody had ever thought it. None of that was part of the contract of how we did it. It was just that they, he needed to get it done. But they didn't get into the boat business to build minesweepers, as yachts were their passion. In the middle of the minesweeper program, John Wells, America's preeminent naval architect, came to the yard with plans for a 96-foot motor yacht for one of the country's wealthiest businessmen. This would be the largest yacht built in the U.S. since World War II and was an outrageous and beautiful yacht. You know, it's, it's interesting when, when we talk about the history of the, of the boat business and families that have been involved in the boat business. And maybe it was more a fraternity than it was an industry. Your father was uh, the iconic um, boat builder. You know, you know, there was director, there was your dad, there was Henry Berger. These were one man, you know, sole proprietorships, and it was their way or the highway. There was people that took risk. Your mom and dad took the risk at the end of the day, I guarantee you. And the same thing that goes there, when you look generationally, as you guys developed new boats and new sales techniques for the market to copy at the end of the day. And we did, God bless you. We did copy a lot of the things you did. Oh, I think the European builders um, back then were jealous of the success that Broward Marine was having. I can remember talking to Paolo Vitelli, who's the CEO of Azimut Manetti, 
And he told me that as a young man, just getting into boat building, his dream, his fantasy, was to build more and larger yachts than Broward Marine. That was his goal in life. Well, in Europe, uh, yes, because actually uh, in the US there was only Broward, and Broward was the largest uh, boat manufacturing company probably worldwide in terms of number and impact and presence on the American soil. Uh, in Europe, we had very traditional old family like uh, the De Vries and the Van Lent and, uh, and the Benetti. Uh, but the impact in the U.S. of Broad Marine was quite massive. But Broward is synonymous with South Florida, and I think that, that the Denison name gave rise, more rise to the meaning of, of, of calling South Florida or Fort Lauderdale the yachting capital of the world. The Denisons did that. Frank and Gertrude's major contribution to the industry, in my mind, are all of the individual companies that have started as a result of what they did. Uh, I owe a lot, and I think the entire industry owes a lot to the Denison family who started this entire business, and it gave a vision for everybody to say, we can do this too. Between the two of them, they came up with innovations that found buyers of the same mindset. These were not old school yachtsmen, but rather risk takers and rule breakers that quickly became the new norm in yachting. Building that Broward was a game changer for me. I met your, your dad, Frank, right? He was terrific, your mother, Gertrude, you know, they were so engaged. It was, it was really a family operation. Broward is a, was always a great brand, and uh, I think so many people today who are in yachting will have started with a Broward. But even to this day, you still see a lot of uh, Browards out there. They're, they're popular yachts. They're being bought and sold all the time. Well, I was born in Cuba. It's just the time I was three years old, my father always had a big boat. So I came to America the first time I had $10, I bought a 16-foot runabout. But when I started making money, I bought a few hatteras. But my dream was always to own a Broward. Your dad was one of the first to realize that the buyer changed and he wanted a different experience. These people are only going to be boating 5% of the time. The other 95% are going to be living on this boat. So they recognized that in a way that I don't think anybody else did and kept going with that concept. No one really was doing that in Europe and Broward were doing these boats with enormous volume. That was a revolution and that created a, a much bigger market for yachting and specifically for the Broward yachts. You know, your parents and, and my father and the fact that they, that they um, over, overlapped on, as they did for a while, just uh, for me is a very, you know, it's a very, it's a very neat uh, coming together. Gertrude broke the mold. You don't have to get wet. You can cook the cookies and take your grandchildren. You can dream of having a, f a villa afloat. Broward reset yachting standards in almost every decade by a simple mantra that Frank Dennison, as well as Gertrude, maintained as a guidepost for their company. If you build the same boat twice, you haven't learned anything. People like Frank Dennison and his family, they led from the front, and they never looked back. So when you ask me what my impression is of, of Frank Dennison and Broward and the family, I mean, you just, you can't overstate the role they played in this industry. When I think of my grandparents and them being honored, um, I can't help but think of what would they think, what would they be feeling, and I know that there would be a lot of gratitude, and I know that they would very much also point to the people that made these boats, right? The amount of jobs and families that were behind the effort to make this happen, to overcome the hard things, to create yachts in good economies and bad economies, uh, they would definitely point to those people. And that's one of the things that I always loved about my grandparents is that they really, really knew that it was never about the big white yacht, it was about the families and the jobs that those big white yachts created locally. I think it's important to realize that taking risks uh, the way they did and the scale that they did, sometimes the impossibility of it all. It was just doing what they loved to do, and I think that is the heartfelt thanks that our industry owes. I certainly do as a son, my brothers, and you have to ask yourself, how did it start? And why did it start here? I think it's because of Frank and Gertrude and what they did on their honeymoon.